Yeah, so that was um, the running mate to John Dramani Mahama uh, and the NDC speaking at her outdooring last week. Uh, some interesting things shared. Ray. First, the, there, were, there were elements in that speech that they are thought-provoking. Not because they are extraordinary words being used, but because we do not hear politicians boldly declare them. That my entire interest is serving the people and i'll focus on the things that make you the people prosper and not things that will make me and my kinsmen actually prosper and that's important because sometimes we need to be reminded of the values and the very important things that politics is supposed to promote again she moved on to talk about something we all perhaps even in our bedrooms agree that there's a lot of arrogance in our governance today there's a lot of the things that do not that's not in your to the benefit but also are downright disrespectful to the people of this country our governance is not as responsive as we want it to be and there are several examples to back this up when the people say that this is wrong and they won't change look at the long length of time it takes for that response to happen so when i hear her saying that i'm not going to have this kind of structure happening or when I am part of government, these things will not happen. And again, she also said, I'm not going to, out of convenience, say I wasn't really in charge. I was, I was really uh, not playing the leading role. So when she said John and I had agreed, it got me thinking, oh, well, there's been some understanding that this is non-negotiable, especially on the part where people who have misused abused and misapplied our resources will be will be taken on will be asked to account for their structure and the things they did there cannot be any functioning democracy without accountability it's almost like a laissez-faire system where people can still loot and do whatever they want and get away with it and we appear to be running a similar one in our part of the world. We know, no matter the kind of stories they tell you or the pretentious institutions and actions that happen, we are not holding enough people accountable for their actions. So it, it affects how even ordinary people respect the laws of the state. You see the usual refrain. When something happens, they will tell you that, oh, well, I mean, if I were to be a politician or linked to any, I'd go free. For this thing, some people are excluded from it. When you send those signals from the top, it affects everybody. And I heard her saying, it will not happen when I am in government. I just hope that after saying all of these things, because Nana Jen Opoku Ajiman's biggest ticket or Trump card going into government or being part of the political electioneering process is integrity. I hope that that is not watered down or she doesn't lose her voice merely because she's gotten into government the expectation is that the same fiery woman will be the same fiery woman when she's in power and that she will not become a part of a looting brigade and now be justified not only justifying it but be giving the people excuses why certain things cannot happen or cannot happen within a certain space we hope that this message is also to her children and grandchildren who are all Ghanaians, who are all within the very system that we find ourselves in. That impunity will not be the standard in governance. And that governance, if she is part of it, will be responsible. We do not want to hear, and she said she will not say it, that she is mate or whatever expression that they use in that space. Hopefully we can hold her to the word, word for word. If we expect prosecutions and she's not doing it, she will not come and tell us that I'm not the Attorney General. That kind of expression, because it's not the agenda, Attorney General who was giving us that promise. You said you are discussing with John Dramani Mahama, and these are the things that you hold dear and deliver on the ground. We won't be accepting excuses going forward. So this is a challenge to be thrown out there. And it's a refreshing challenge because a lot more people steer directly away from it or happen to skirt around it. It's almost as if some of these things have become entrenched in our politics and that we can never get rid of it. Those are the ones that I picked from the speech as things that I'm interested in. As for 1,000 or is it 1 million people being trained in, I mean, see, frankly, I take general promises of this nature with a pinch of salt. 
because I think they make it without understanding what will be the future of this country within the next few months. If you come here and you do not have a peswa to do some of these things, I'm not going to be fighting over it. But it is the integrity with which you run the affairs of the state. It is ensuring accountability. It is making sure that you do not steal our resources because age is no barrier to stealing. There is so much evidence to back it. <laughs> yes, I mean, nobody can give me those excuses. And if you, I mean, those conversations, they say, oh, professors, rich people, they don't steal. That's not true, too. We know for a fact that the richest people on earth are still finding means to get more money. How much more are so-called rich? So, I mean, I'm not one of those who accepts those, th that kind of conversation. But I'm interested in people who reassert the values of state and leadership which is what I thought she did for most part of the speech. There are other ones that I didn't get the point, but well, you may never get to 100% anyway. Well, <clears throat> I mean, um, if you, and I've been reading the speech after, I mean, haven't listened to her, haven't watched her. I've read the speech. So, you know, when she gets into everything, she starts talking about, you know, her joy of being, uh, you know, nominated to be running mate and everything. Uh, she talks about what is happening today. Then she goes into the report of John Dramani Mahama. So this is how you see it going. First of all, she talks about what we find ourselves in today. And it's a nice way of actually getting your uh, supporters on their feet, cheering you on. Because you'd have to start by, you know, getting them excited. And she did that with, you know, those words, phrases. I mean, they always, you know, I mean, it's a nice way of catching people's attention. Even during our university days, when you come up with these phrases, it actually you know, catch the attention of people, okay? I mean, I remember uh, in those days saying that we don't get water to bath, but we get water to water grasses. <laughs> when I was at the university. Yes, 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 yes. When I was uh, yeah. in my manifesto, you'd have to say that to get students cheering. Yeah. Because, you know, because of the water problems in Cape Coast. And fountains work. Fountains work, but bathrooms don't have water. Exactly. You know, those are, these are normal things that you would use. So <laughs> it's always good to get the attention of the people who are listening to you. So it's good when you use, you say these things, then you get their attention. But then she goes into the report card of the NPP, okay, by saying this is not what the NDC's report card was or will be if we were to, you know, were to go into them. So she talks about all the perceived ills of the government. Mm -hmm. She then goes into what the report card of John Dramani Mahama will be. And then she starts talking about, you know, the good things that John Mahama has done, the infrastructural development that he did, and then goes into what you can expect. She starts off with a 24-hour economy and talks about in San Rejuma so people would have to do things. That's when the, you know, the coding comes in. This is how I see it, Raymond and Kojo. The reason I take political party promises seriously is that I want to hold you accountable the next time. And I do so by making you aware that this time around, you just will not write and go. But when you write, we would interrogate and ask you to come and defend it. So that, you know, in Parliament, there's something they say, the Government Assurances Committee. Mm -hmm. They say whenever uh, any minister or the president comes to Parliament to come and make any promise or anything he says, they will check whether that is being delivered on. Then she moves into talking about a women's development bank. I ask myself the question, uh, Raymond and Kojo, do we need a women's development bank? Do we start a whole band which is supposed to, you know, help create female entrepreneurs? I would say no. I will say you can actually create a scheme that could be disbursed by a bank. Because I am not in favor of Maslock. I am not in favor of NEIP. I am not in favor of all those schemes that are housed at the seat of the presidency. Because it only becomes an avenue for political party persons getting there. I like the idea that you want to help grow women entrepreneurs. I like the idea that you want to help grow women businesses. But in doing so, be mindful of the fact that if the Women Development Bank is supposed to be a scheme and not another bank, no problem. You can actually have a women development scheme at a bank. Today, there are foundations that are giving money to farmers in this country. You go there, you show that you, and you, pay, you, you take this money and then you will pay eventually. Okay, you take the money. If, I mean, the current lending rates are 30%, they could give you 10, 5%. But there's a Women's World Banking, right? Yes, there is. Okay. So if you want to do the Women's Development Bank, I say you can actually create a scheme 
and get it functioning. I mean, I'm not so excited about the uh, governments creating banks and all. We've seen the evidence around. The one million coders, well, on the surface of it, sounds like that's a good thing because that's where the world is moving. But we create one million coders. Well, I mean, they have some jobs because this is the woman that is supposed to be in charge of um, health, education, gender, and social protection, among others, as John Mahama indicated. But that's another area they would have to look at again. What is it that you want to do? So after training these persons, what happens? It's, some, it's a conversation we must have. Silicon Valley. Well, it's a conversation we must have. So, you know, it's, it's a good idea, but let's have the conversation. Let's broaden it, and let's get to understand what it is that you want to do. On the whole, I'd say that, yes, um, this is an improvement from 2020, certainly. She's talked about things that I think, why not? We have to think about as a people. Because if we get a lot of women entrepreneurs, that's good news. They're going to be helping in creating jobs. And we've sat down this morning, we've talked about the need to create jobs. And we've said that if we create jobs, we may not need to think about increasing I mean, uh, I mean the uh, current percentage of contribution. We, all we have to do is to get more people registering, and then we are good to go. And these formalized things will be a nice way to go. What I would have wanted to hear, for instance, you know, in creating those entrepreneurs also, we must actually have a conversation about effective record and bookkeeping, Raymond. It is only part of the way that we can get these people to actually grow their businesses. One of the things we do in this country consistently is that we always look at the number of people we have given money to without thinking about the impact those people have made. And so we consistently talk about, I have given money to 1,000 people, mm. without talking about the contribution of these 1,000 people to the Ghanaian population, and by extension, the Ghanaian economy. And, and they report to uh, us the amount of money they have shared to people. Yes. So it's, it's an end in itself, not a means not to an end. Not a means to an end. But what we want to see is that the end is that because I gave this number of people, say, a thousand Ghana cities or a million Ghana cities, this is how the country has expanded, and this is how the economy has grown, and this is how much tax of it we've gotten. So she talks about the, um, you know, the unemployment rate, which has moved to 14%, 14.7% the last time, and it's about um, over a million people unemployed. So if you're, bringing, if you're bringing up coding and all of these things, you want to give the people some skills. Beyond the skills, how do these translate into job opportunities? These are conversations we must have. She set the tone for us to have a conversation, but again, this would not be an end in itself. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, you guys have talked a lot about the substance. Um, I will end just by touching briefly on the form. And, uh, again, every time we talk about Prof. Nana Jane I have to issue my disclaimer <laughs> that uh, we're talking about someone I know personally. Uh, and so, uh, sometimes I have to, you know, make it quite clear. This is not just regular analysis for me. Some of it comes from uh, knowing more than what is already out in the public domain. But, um, having said that, Look, I think Prof. Nana Jinopukajiman did a solid job in this her outdooring speech. She did a solid job for a number of reasons. It's not because of the specific things she said. I mean, the things she said will always be subject to the partisan debate, right? Um, so it's not about that. It's not about. And besides, she didn't really say anything that was new. Okay, she criticized government. That's not new. She said, "John and I have decided that we will prosecute." corrupt people that's not new either in fact <laughs> it's not something you should even promise people it's it's what the law requires besides the ndc made these promises in the past that they will prosecute their predecessors i mean what's their record there how many of their predecessors did, did they prosecute under atamils or, or mahama himself so i mean there was there it's not because she said anything new it was because First of all, 
This is her personal best. This is not the standard of oratory skill that we are used to from Prof. Nana Jinopokwajiman. One of her biggest criticisms in the past was that her speeches and addresses were not memorable. She didn't say things that were quotable. She didn't say things that people can refer to in future discussions. That she could talk for ages and walk away and you didn't really know what you are walking away with. Even though she, sp she speaks well with intelligence, she didn't have that charismatic political edge of being able to drop sound bites. Well, there was no sign of that weakness last week during her uh, inaugural speech. It was soundbite after soundbite delivered in a way that is smooth and memorable. She was poised. She spoke in that interactive way that always gets people engaged. She would ask, you know, should I go on? After she had given about 10 points on a subject, she would ask, should I go on? And then the crowd would shout yes, and then she would continue. When she wanted to address the youth, she say, are the youth here? They would respond. Then she would continue. These are just little things things that are skills she never used to exhibit and it was refreshing to see her exhibit them in even the little slips i thought were to her benefit for example there was a point when she was saying something and she said even the things i have listed above <laughs> when you are giving a speech you really do not say above above what teacher uh-huh <laughs> but these were things that reminded me as a viewer that the person i'm I'm watching is not a stereotypical politician. It reminded me of her academic background. It all helped to give a certain impression of someone who is in politics but is not a politician. And at this point, the way Ghanaians feel, that is an advantage. So I think in terms of the form, these things really helped. But let me also talk about what didn't go so well. And in fact, just one more thing that helped. The reason why what she did worked was because her own party has done a very bad job of doing this in the past. The, her own party has missed opportunities to make such obvious jabs at their opponent. On panel discussions, they spend all their time talking about Baumia, Baulaya, about this, about this, about that. They are making Baumia more, more popular than the NPP is. She took the opportunity to point out the numerous ways in which Ghanaians have expressed their displeasure with the current government. And she did it in a way that was memorable. I mean, did you, you, I don't know if you guys remember what she said about the Abuboya and I confirm flying faster than, uh, uh, was it Abuboya and um, uh, excavators flying faster than I confirm? Mm -hmm. I mean, that was a soundbite. And the, the parties have, the party itself has not been doing as well. In punching their opponent. Now let me talk about what didn't go so well. All of her sound bites were good. The one that I thought maybe, well, I, and I may be the only one who thinks this. I, I may be alone on this, but you know the point she made about how she will never say she's the driver's meat, right? When she was t talking directly to the president and said that, you know, when when things come to a head, she will never, for her own, you know, self interest, declare that. She was only a driver's mate. And everybody in the room was cheering. And I was thinking, ah, have you people forgotten that you are the same ones who criticized Baumia? That you, if you claim that you were different from Akufuado, if you claim that you disagreed with things like E. Levy, if you claim that you didn't like all the borrowing they were doing, if you claim that you were making suggestions that were not being taken, then you should have spoken up about it. You should have even resigned. This is the criticism the NDC has leveled against uh, Dr. Baumia. So how do you criticize Dr. Baumia for not step st uh, standing out and away from things he didn't agree with? And then your own running mate says, as for me, even if I don't agree, I'll still say I agree. I will not say I'm the, I was driver's mate. And, and they are cheering. So for me, I think there was a, just a, a bit of a logic gap there. Um, but this is the real problem with Prof. Nana Jinupukwajiman's speech. And it's not anything she said. It's the fact that the party has again failed to maximize the good job she did. So when I switch on my phone, 
I'm not seeing memes. I'm not seeing cartoons of a confirmed and excavators flying in a race. I'm not seeing things that will make the, what she said stick even longer in people's minds. Once again, she has given her address and the party is sitting back hoping that as a part better no. That expression in itself is ridiculous. Adipa can never turn its home. If you do something and you think it is worth selling, you must sell it. You must promote it. Otherwise, you can't just hang it in your room and hope that by the time you wake up, it will be sold. They must sell her. They must take advantage of her strengths. What are her strengths? There are two main strengths they should be taking advantage of. The first one is that she's a woman. Both of you have alluded to it. In politics in Ghana, people hesitate before they attack a woman. I'll never forget when I was doing some analysis somewhere and I said that um, uh, the uh, co communications minister, uh, um, Ursula Ousekufo, when I said that, she has a rude and abrasive uh, communication style. And I was attacked by women in the audience. Like, well, how can you say that? If a man was talking like that, we would have said he's assertive. And I said, that's not true. When men are rude, we say it. When uh, members of when uh, the, the uh, roads minister was being rude, we said it. Uh, being rude is not a gender-specific thing. But in Ghana, we are very sensitive to these gender uh, you know, uh, rules. And so it's an advantage that as a political party, they should be taking. They should be putting her front and center. Because when she attacks, responding is harder than responding to a man. It's a simple fact. And they should be taking advantage of it. And the second advantage is that she has a reputation for integrity. I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm choosing my words carefully. She has a reputation for integrity. That's an advantage. So that means that when she is, is attacking your opponent, your opponent can't point to any skeletons in her closet. They are forced to simply debate her record. And that's an easy debate to have. So they should be taking advantage of these things and putting her front and center and training her well to have that quick response, have that you know uh, institutional memory so that she can quickly bring up issues. I don't know if you guys remember the Baumia interview that was done on Joy. And all the questions we were put into him and how he was quickly battling them off. Because he had been prepared to do that. And they should take advantage and do the same for Prof. Nana Jinopo Right now, the only thing that can let her down is her own party. 